lot of ways to mislead people. So there's, I'm, I'm just give a couple here. So misleading graphs, you can represent something visually that'll allow you to influence people to come to a wrong conclusion. So the first question, how can inappropriately drawn graphs misrepresent the data and lead the reader to false conclusions? The big thing is changing the scale, um, either making the scale really small, so it's only like a tenth instead of being a whole numbers, or truncating the scale where you start just at the very top and go up a certain amount. So changing the scale uh, it will help to exaggerate things and also changing from one dimensional increase by showing it in two dimensions. So you go from like a bar graph to a picture graph where the pictures are a different size and make things look a little bit off. So if you redraw a scale from 0 to 100%, it will look much different than if you redraw the scale and start at 95%. So they had um, this percentage of manufacturers automobiles they were advertising. They had the most on the road for longer. And so we're going to look at the two different graphs. If you look at this first graph, boy, it looks like they are way ahead. And this is using the truncated scale from 95 to 100%. You can see, wow, what a difference. They're really doing a good job. But look over here at the scale, 95, 96, 97, 98%. It's only 2% difference between the high and the low, but it visually looks like, wow, they're doing something. If you, so it makes it look like there's a large difference between the manufacturers. However, when we change the scale, look how static they are. They're very close together. So we can see that the difference could be considered pretty minor between the one manufacturer and the, their competitor. Here's another one that I love is this is a real life example about global warming and they had that whole WikiLeaks thing and that. But if you look here, it says the yearly values are here with the blue stars, the low and the high, the average temperatures. And then this is the filtered values and this is the long term mean. And you can see that it really looks like we're having all these temperature variations. But if you look over here, this is 52 degrees, this is 54 degrees, and this is degrees, Celsius, degrees Celsius on this side, degrees Fahrenheit over here. But that's only two degrees difference. That's very, very minute. And this is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They also like to show pictures of the ice caps melting, but they always show that at the late summer when they've melted all summer. And then they show, oh, what they used to look like in the heat of, in the dead winter when it's the very coldest and the most ice is formed. So you got to watch people. Here's another one. And if you look at the scale here, look how exaggerated this looks, that it's just going way up and down. And this is a satellite-based temperature, but these are a tenth of a degree we're talking, not very much. Here's a big one that's got a lot of stuff on it, but this is a global temperatures from 2500 BC to 2880. Now, how they did that all the way back, I don't know. And this brings up another thing. You need to look at people's sources. So they're, um, just because this looks like a lot of stuff, uh, their idea is, that the cold and the heat are more influenced by volcanic activity and, and solar flares and things like that. So there's been at least 75 major temperature swings in the last 4,500 years, if you look from then to then. So um, eh, it's a, pretty interesting with the global warming. Here's the battle of the graphs, and I liked this one. This is the one that Al Gore used to show the hockey stick of how it's just really going up there. But look at that, it's 0 0.05 degrees Celsius, the difference. Whereas if you look at the climactic changes, and they went 0.5 still, but you can see it goes up and goes down, and there's the average temperature. It's really not that high. It used to be a lot higher in the 1100s and 1200s in Europe. So this hockey stick, you know, that's how they do it is they change the scale here. It makes people panic and want to give up their air conditioning. I'm sorry, I will never give up my air conditioning willingly. All right, and here's how this, this is another graph. It shows um, the 95% certain estimates of the earth heating up were a spectacular miscalculation. It's showing where the temperature is now, right here. And they said, oh, it's gonna be way up here and it's gonna go crazy and we're all gonna die.
kind of thing. Alrighty, so let's start about talking about time series graphs. And the first ones we're going to do is I pulled some data about automobile manufacturers over the last five years. So 2007 through 2012, and here's the percent of the global automotive production that the U.S. has done. So in 2007, it was about 15%, and then it went down to 9%, 10%, and it's making a slow rise. But I also pulled up China's. And look how theirs went. Now, if we do this on a scale from 0 to 100, and we plot these points, so we go to 2007 and put a point at um, 14, where we think 15 would be, somewhere in there, and then 12, and so on, it's going to look like a straight line. We can't really make much distinction, because these values are all between 0 and 20, and they're about halfway. That's the best we can do. So it kind of looks like a static line. We do China's, theirs is 12.1, so a little lower than that one, and then 13.2, they overtook us in 2008, and 2009, 22.3, 23.5, 23, and 22.9, which is about 23. So here's China's, and it doesn't look very big either. Like that, that's no big deal, staying kind of constant. So the interpretation would be that the production in U.S. has been static, no change, and China's production has risen, but not dramatically. However, if we expand this out, instead of going to 100%, if we go from 10 to 25%, so we go up by fives, 10, 15, 20, 25, then we're going to see a difference. So if we do our USA and we plot those values again, we can get a more, we can see the trend. It dramatizes the trend a little bit for us. If we do China and we plot those points, you really get an idea of how much they've overtaken us with production and overtaken the world. We used to be in the 90s, we were between 20 and 25 percent manufacturing cars, um, and today we are, we have gone down a lot. So you can see where we started our decline, they started their ascent. And so that's the way uh, statistics is, is looking at data and seeing if we can find a trend. As production in the U.S. has decreased, production in China has increased dramatically. As has their pollution, but they don't care. So here we go. Exaggerating a one-dimensional increase by showing it in two dimensions is yet another way to mislead people. This is in your book, this bar graph. And it shows you the cost in millions of a Super Bowl commercial. So yeah, you can see, hey, it's gone up a lot, over a million dollars. But this was back in 1995, which you were probably still sucking your thumb back then. And this is how it would look if you did it in two dimensions. Why does this look so dramatically different than this? To us, this looks so much bigger. It's because your eye, as a human, will look at the areas instead of looking at the height. And there, the, the height here supposed to be about one to show the difference between where the height was before but when you do an area like a circle it makes it much more dramatic so visually this dramatizes a change because the air eye is comparing areas and um, that's why that you got to be careful about that unless you're trying to mislead people so here's the, we're, we're kind of going to our summary. There's another couple ways people mislead graphs. They leave off the scale and that kind of thing. So you got to watch it and you also got to check your sources on different stuff. So here's what we have done so far this chapter. The good news is we're done. So draw a sketch of the six types of graphs and summarize how each type is used. So first off we had the histogram, which is a bar graph. And this is a frequency polygon. Both of these are used when the data is contained in a group frequency distribution along with the OGIV. It's used when the data is grouped in a frequency distribution as well. The Pareto chart. Now, what I noticed a lot of people forgot is these have to go in descending order. That's the difference between a Pareto chart and the bar graph. So it's used to show frequencies for nominal or qualitative variables. That means names like sleep, like, you know, different categories of things when you're trying to compare it. Time series graph, x-axis is time, and then this is your y value of frequency. So it's used to show a pattern or trend that occurs over a period of time. And pie graph, it's used to show the relationship between the parts and the whole. It's most often uses percentages in there. It's when you want to compare how much of, the, of this whole thing is each little piece. 
All right, that's it, and I will see you later.